Computer Age Management Services, QC and 9M FY23 conference call, organize, organized by Orient Capital. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. We request all the participants to kindly refer to the safe harbor statement in the earnings presentation. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Anuj Kumar, Managing Director, CAMS. Thank you and over to you, sir. Hi, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Michelle. I hope all of you are able to hear me clearly. Uh, I appreciate all of you taking the time out to join our earnings call. Uh, as you may have seen in the results, uh, we've had a satisfying quarter, and I have a number of things to share with you, uh, significantly in terms of uh, operating highlights. As we continue to work in a business environment uh, which had a set of challenges to deal with, I think uh, the overall outlook for the quarter in terms of business results has been uh, very satisfactory. I will run you through uh, a structured presentation, uh, starting off just in terms of our mutual fund business. You would have seen that we announced two new wins, two new logo wins. These are always uh, an important part of our uh, overall endeavor to uh, maintain share and relevance in the marketplace. Uh, Helios Capital, which is entering the mutual fund market through a new license, has chosen to join the CAMS platform. This decision came in the month of uh, November. And then uh, Navi Mutual Fund, which was an existing mutual fund, uh, but under a new management uh, after the takeover of an existing fund, has also chosen to uh, select CAMS as their provider. So that's the good news on the new logo win on the mutual fund side. Uh, overall, on the core business metrics, um, our AUM scaled a lifetime high of 27.8 trillion rupees, or just short of 28 lakh crore rupees. This came on the back of uh, what I would call steady growth in uh, equity AUM, which is, of course, uh, the, the, the most uh, relevant, best priced, the profitable part of our business mix. Uh, that grew 6.1% quarter in quarter. And we will speak a lot more about uh, which fund business as we move along. On the alternatives business, we saw another uh, very strong quarter. Uh, we grew uh, revenue and sales over 20%. Uh, during the quarter, and our uh, digital onboarding platform, which is Camps WellServe, continued to see sustained interest and, uh, and a slew of wins in the marketplace. It has now crossed, um, as of end of December, over 60 signups, and we continue to see a lot of interest and momentum in the marketplace as we brought in our sales effort and outreach. Uh, on the e-insurance side, where all of you have been uh, following the media and following the announcements, uh, regulatory announcements in terms of uh, DMAT regime coming up and uh, a mandatory KYC requirement for all kinds of insurance, uh, I would like to call out two things. While while that uh, while that topic is progressing and we all continue to watch uh, specific regulatory announcements, what we saw happen in the quarter was that in anticipation of a regime of compulsory demand. Consumers voluntarily chose to join up this regime. So you will see, and although all of this is on a small base and we normally don't call out very stark comparison numbers, but this is a stark comparison number. <coughs> Our insurance accounts, the new ones, at close to five lakh, almost doubled quarter on quarter. And similarly, our uh, e-policies uh, during the quarter uh, crossed 5 lakh, and uh, this also almost doubled uh, quarter on quarter. So 3Q over 2Q was a significant growth, all on a small base, of course, but a very, very uh, positive consumer-driven outcome in terms of consumers watching an announcement and then aligning their own uh, behavior to take advantage of the very convenient regime that is about to come into uh, the world of insurance. Uh, on the CAMS FinServe side, which is our account aggregator business, uh, I think we continue to report uh, positive news in terms of going live with several uh, FIPs and FIUs. Uh, 
and continuing to win business. Uh, one of the things on the highlights I would like to call out is that um, CAMS has now pioneered the usage of account aggregated data for bank account validation, as you know. For any format of pay payment across industries, whether it is insurance, mutual fund, NDSCs, banks, uh, so far, uh, one rupee penny drop or a penny drop through IMPS has been considered a very convenient tool. Uh, this is the first time we are trying out account aggregated data to validate back accounts. It's a nice beginning. It's the first uh, first experiment or usage of this use case, and we will continue to share with you as we scale this. Uh, we've also been the first one to go live on the account aggregator platform with pension data as an NDS CRA. Uh, as an FIP. Uh, insurance companies, as you know, have started integration with the AA ecosystem. Uh, the mutual funds are beginning. So that, as the story completes, will herald uh, an era of almost uh, all kinds of financial services sectoral entities joining the account aggregator platform. On the overall innovation and technology side, again, uh, a very strong quarter. Two highlights uh, that I'll share with you, which you perhaps read about on our website and other uh, media news. One is that CAMS won the Cloud Innovator of the Year Award from NASCOM. This was particularly in reference to our putting out a fully on cloud uh, NPS CRA platform. And like we've said to you in the past, uh, we were the first ones, and this has been acknowledged quite well by a very large industry body like NASCOM. And then, um, and then uh, just deepening the trend of uh, technology-led innovation, technology-led experimentation, tinkering, whatever word you want to use. So we've gone live now with our FinTech Innovation Lab with IIT Madras. As you know, amongst the IITs, too, for all of you who've been tracking, IIT Madras has perhaps got a place of pride in terms of uh, you know, doing industry collaborations and, and generally having interfaces which are very, very strong with industry. So uh, as part of our overall uh, CSR initiative, we've gone live with this lab. And we will have interesting things to report as we move forward and engage uh, the brightest brains in the country, both from the faculty side, uh, students, and other participants, in bringing out uh, in bringing out uh, services, conveniences, utilities, and perhaps products, which will start influencing the lives of people that we want to influence. On the on the NPS side, uh, we continue to retain the number two position, and you know that it is still not one year since we launched, uh, just short of 10%, so about 9.2% market share. What's also happened is that we are now seeing subscriber addition not just through ENPS, which is something uh, that I just spoke about, but our POP retail linkages, where a point of presence has retail traffic on their website, and then and that traffic starts uh, registering with CAM CRA. Uh, that process began sometime in December. Uh, we are seeing a build out of volumes. Our uh, consumer side continues to remain over 90%. So, quite happy with the progress in all of these uh, new initiatives that we've been sharing with you all through 2022. And I know all of you have been curious about uh, when they become, uh, I, I would say, heavy in terms of subscriber interest, B2B interest, and ultimately revenues. Uh, moving on, uh, just in terms of uh, uh, growth in overall AUM, which you know is, is the basic core operating metric on which everything changes in our industry. Uh, despite the times that we are living in where you know that there have been a set of macroeconomic factors all through FI22, uh, nothing much changed in the, in the quarter we're talking about. Uh, we've lived through those challenges. Um, also, we've lived through an interest rate regime that continues to uh, scale interest rates to almost levels which are not very precedented in the recent past. Uh, given that backdrop, which has not been very easy, I think um, our overall AUM growth uh, has been satisfactory. We are now reporting a lifetime high of 27.8 uh, trillion rupees. And like I said, this has largely been riding on a smart uh, equity AUM growth, both year on year and quarter on quarter, if you see the numbers you see almost an 18% plus year-on-year -year percent uh, growth number over the past quarter. Equity AUM at the end of the quarter was just shy of 13 lakh crore at 12.9. Also, I think a significant metric is, and, and uh, I know all of you are watching inflows, uh, our equity net inflow share has gone to 63.7%. Of course, we continue to watch this closely. 
as uh, this number builds out and I think one basic bedrock this is building itself on is the monthly SIP collections and I'll just come to that. But I think overall at the foundational level, despite uh, what we are seeing structurally, uh, I would say these are, these are very positive trends uh, to look at. Similarly, on new SIP registrations, you know that uh, a large part or a, or a notable part of uh, the industrial dissipation now commences with SIP. So a number of 37 lakh and 37 lakh plus has actually grown a little uh, from first quarter to second and second to third, 37 to almost 38.3 lakh. I think that holding number growing about 2% every quarter uh, has been a very good number so at about 38.3. Uh, that is a new SIP registration. Uh, net of attentions, etc. cetera, new uh, live SIPs grew over 12 lakh. And I think... Uh, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, sir. We are experiencing slight static. Uh, on your line right now. So I'll connect you back, sir. Can I do that? Yeah, sure. Do that, please. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gen gentlemen, please stay connected while we try to reconnect the management again. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. The management line has been connected. Over to you, sir. sir please carry on. Continue. Sir, we are not able to hear you. भारतीय डाक विभाग आजादी के अमृत महोत्सव Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. The management line has been connected. Over to you, sir. Special thanks. I hope uh, there is no static and the voice is clear now. Uh, yes, sir. It's much better now. Please okay. continue. All right. Uh, so apologies, team. Uh, maybe there was a blip uh, in the line. I will just commence back where I left. We were talking about SIP registrations uh, holding between first, second, and third quarters at a number above 37 lakh, growing about 2% from 1Q to 2 and 2 to 3. Uh, net of attritions and net of fall-offs, uh, live SIPs grew by about 12 lakh in the October to December period. But I think uh, a very strong, steady metric is the 7,800 crore per month of SIP collections during the quarter. And this, as you've seen in our case, has continued to go up. Uh, obviously, uh, there are no, no certainties, but continues to go up by an average of 150 to 200 crore a month. And I think that's almost formed the bedrock of uh, equity net sales in the industry. This number grew by uh, almost 6%, slightly ahead of industry growth. Uh, transaction volumes grew, uh, you can see in the chart, uh, again, a good measure of customer engagement. And I think when you see new fund offerings, and we're going to talk about uh, two segments of new fund offerings, in equities, uh, we had a 70% share of collections. In debt, we had an 86% share. So the two categories which really matter, I think uh, both from a new fund offering and SIP collection and share of equity net inflow, those have been very steady metrics uh, leading to where the AUM has been. And I think, uh, like I said, given the backdrop of the times, uh, it's all holding quite well. So, no, no. Move forward.
we spoke about uh, we spoke about the new initiatives uh, on ms central i think uh, the the trend of consumer participation and consumer satisfaction that line is holding very steady the the apps have now crossed a daily login of 10000 of course this number uh, our aspiration is to scale it significantly several x times where it is but at 10000 um, it shows a good uh, you know a good index of consumer participation and then when you see in terms of other value which is not just consumers coming to the app but consumers going to any other app or website and being able to access this information uh, ms central has now got live apis absolutely live apis where you can pick up your combined account statement this includes um, all your mutual fund data and all means all it, uh, it it gets you live api based data from the depositories um, it only the ms data by the way not the stock data but uh, that comes in both for your etf holdings and ms holdings and of course everything that is in the rti records the first of its kind and then as that is live and as we continue to scale it uh, there is more happening on the financial information financial transaction side and the non commercial transaction side where we are making distributor based apis live now and uh, that will then broad base the usage of this utility to direct consumers to consumers who come to the app and website directly and to all consumers who may be using any other uh, partner app or website but will be using the data cash and then the transactable the transactability mm -hmm. through the financial transaction and non financial transaction apis uh in terms of market share then uh, 68.3% uh, market share like we said largely riding on a 6% quarter on quarter growth in sip collections 23% plus year on year uh, overall eum at 27.8 trillion grew for an, about 4.3% year on year 2.9% quarter on quarter and similarly equity eum as you would have seen uh, continue to grow well 18.8% year on year 6.1% Uh, quarter to quarter uh other metrics uh you've seen the transaction volumes the sip book has grown 20% uh, annually like i said uh, very strong foundational metric the sip book stands at uh, very close to 3.4 crores to 24 million we processed uh, 97 plus million sip transactions uh, live consumer folios investor folios Uh, close to 5.6 crore now growing for 10 year on year and unique investor service are a little over 24 and a half billion so about 2.45 crore again grew 14% year on year on the alternative business uh, like i spoke when we were talking about the headlines headlines the ai business grew 20% year on year uh, in the third quarter uh, almost 17 new aif and pms mandates one so more than one per week Uh, during the quarter just uh, holding out the trend that we have uh, faced or that we have experienced in the across uh, almost the entire year calendar 2022 uh, 50 funds have signed up for ai and pms digital on board in the camps uh, well sir uh, on fintuple we continue to make inroads with last ticket wins from marquee clients uh, and then on the gift city we are now uh, scaling operations and we are present in the gift city operating with seven signed up clients Uh, on the account aggregator uh, overall total 55 account aggregator in tsp bonds uh, large medium small all kinds 20 in the third quarter uh, i spoke about uh, the the <coughs> customer way, account uh, verification way. that camps is uh, pioneering across the industry uh, through account aggregator data and we we plan to scale this and make it a uh, lot more popular Uh, we've been to all the major metros uh, engaging with the consumers we do big connects of all kinds um, in terms of uh, holding events to popularize the a concept uh, across various use cases including wealth management and overall over 18 banks and one life insurance company are live as financial information provider on the on the pension side like we said uh, we are the first to go live on the account aggregator platform with pension data uh, the iid entities are now initiating the integration journey and then 
uh, high volume cash flow based lending use cases using GST data uh, are now beginning to become popular. And then uh, we we are <coughs> building out uh, capabilities and utilities to take all of that to market. On the CRA side, you would have seen uh, the various numbers that we put out. I think the significant thing is uh, over a 9% share in ENPS, uh, continuing to hold the number two position in the industry. Uh, commenced our entire uh, journey on POP retail customer acquisition, so have taken about seven POPs live and are beginning to get traffic from them uh, starting in the month of December. And then I think from an innovation and transformation perspective, industry first features of uh, CAM CRA using CKYC data to onboard uh, pension customers. And then UPI-based bank account verification. Uh, these are things which are being noticed by the industry, including the regulatory circles, and are actually being recommended to our peers uh, for them to implement just like CAMS has implemented. Uh, on the cash case side, uh, just from a product and markets perspective, uh, UPI auto pay feature is now live with seven clients, uh, very popular, including for mutual fund purchases. Uh, we've gone live with Insta SIP, where a same day SIP can be started by making a one-time investment and then uh, setting up a setting up an auto pay kind of mechanism uh, for the same day. Uh, and similarly, we've uh, continued to scale various business features, including uh, Insta e -Natch and giving out a business app to our B2B consumers for merchants and their customers to experience a completely frictionless journey in the dealings with camp space. <laughs> On the camp's rep side, uh, we've spoken about uh, two things in the last quarter. One is uh, KYC to become mandatory for purchase of any kind of insurance, uh, that has now gone live and we are working with partners and clients in order to be a large participant in, in that space. And then I think from a numbers perspective, from a consuming numbers perspective, I've spoken about a 2x growth from 2x to 3x in the number of uh, e-insurance accounts that were opened and in the number of uh, e-policies which are brought into those e-insurance accounts. Like I said, uh, stock, very nice growth numbers, coming up a small base, but a good measure of what consumers can do by themselves even before there is a uh, regulatory framework as consumers open these accounts and pull their policies themselves. We now have over 4 million e-insurance accounts, uh, 5 million plus policies. On our, uh, on our AI-infused initiative, to pay back unclaimed insurance amounts to consumers. Uh, we are now doing this for several insurance companies, started with a base of 750 crore rupees of unclaimed amounts, and then uh, managed to spot the right claimants for about 135 crore and pay the money. So I think they, that that uh, product is now uh, going quite well and will continue uh, scaling in popularity because uh, finding the claimants of unclaimed money is, I think, continues to remain a priority for insurance companies. It is a priority for all kinds of financial entities just to make sure there is transparency with respect to this, uh, this operation. So uh, that, that uh, product feature is gone very well. I will pause here and then uh, hand over to my colleague Ram Sarah to take you through all the financial numbers after we will be ready for q &A. Thank you, Anuj. Uh, so I will take the next five minutes to go through the financial numbers for the quarter. Uh, the revenue for the quarter, we ended up 243.57 crores. Uh, this was up 2.5% year on year and 0.5% quarter on quarter. As you know, the component of the revenue, there are three components. One is the asset-based revenue, one is the non-asset-based revenue, and the non-MF revenue. During the quarter on a year-on-year on -year basis for the same quarter, our AEM equity grew 4.3 percentage. Uh, we, we ended the quarter with 27.83 lakh crores uh, as opposed to uh, we had 26.99 lakh crores in the same quarter last year. So that was a 4.3 percent up on AEM. The asset-based fee also tracked the same number. It was up 4.5 percent year on year and we ended at 187.5 crores of asset based revenue. The second component, the non asset based revenue, uh, we saw a dip year on year, a sharp dip of 8.8%. This dip was mainly driven by the drop in transaction revenue during the quarter. 
and lesser NFO revenue during the quarter. The early year there were a lot of slew of launches that happened from an NFO perspective. And there was some amount of uh, uh, depletion from a uh, miscellaneous um, application revenue. So uh, on a year-on-year -year basis, there was a sharp dip in the non-asset-based revenue, but the asset-based revenue tracked the growth in assets. Uh, from non-MF revenue, on a year-on-year -year basis, we grew 4.2 percent. Uh, driven again, Anit was mentioning about the smart uh, growth that we are seeing in the alternate space, CAF space. So driven largely by the uh, traction we are seeing on the alternate investment fund signups as well as revenue. Uh, we grew a non-MF revenue by 4.2 percent year on year. There was some amount of increase because of higher transactions processed by our payment platform Camps Pay. Uh, however, there was some decrease because of uh, the KRA, new KRAs coming onto the system. So KRA revenue was was lesser than the earlier uh, earlier qu uh, quarter. So on an overall basis, uh, the summary is that uh, asset based revenue year on year tracked the growth in assets at four and a half percent. The non asset based revenue grew uh, depleted in 8.8 percentage, driven largely by transaction revenue, NFO revenue. And the non-MF revenue increased year-on-year -year basis 4.2 percent, driven by alternate investments and payment businesses. Uh, but on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, uh, uh, the, the revenue increase uh, was 0.5 percent, out of which the asset-based revenue grew 1.4 percentage. The assets growth during this period uh, was around 2.9 percentage. So there was a reduction uh, from the overall asset growth to asset fee growth in the what we see in the current quarter which uh, leads to the question on yields, which I will touch upon later. And uh, on a non-asset-based revenue, it was almost flat, uh, just 1% quarter-on-quarter down, again driven by reduction mm -hmm. in the transaction revenue. Uh, uh, that kind of largely drove the mm -hmm. small reduction in the non-asset-based revenue quarter-on-quarter. -quarter. The non-MF revenue uh, did not uh, grow. It actually grew by 3.9% quarter-on-quarter. This was largely driven by uh, some reduction that we saw on the payments businesses uh, uh, during the quarter. However, we see some sort of uh, increase in revenue that is coming to us from the payment business in the fourth quarter. Uh, but overall, the non-MF revenue did decrease by almost 4%, uh, driven largely by reduction in the uh, payments businesses and some amount of KRA business. From a yield perspective, uh, you know, uh, we have already, uh, we consistently have guided that, you know, given the telescopic pricing and the, uh, sometimes the price discussions that happens with the customers, uh, they always there will be a lag between the asset growth and the asset fee growth. Our, our long-term, medium-term trend has been uh, between 75, uh, around 75 to 80 percentage uh, of the asset growth will translate as asset fee growth. Over the year and over the nine-month period, although we have seen stable yields, largely driven by the fact that although there has been some price depletion, this has been compensated by the favorable mix ratio that we got because the equity mix has recovered smartly. It is around 46.4 percent for the quarter. So the any price depletion that happens because of the reasons I mentioned has been largely compensated on a year-on-year -year as well as a nine-month basis by the mix. However, on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, the, the equity component growth was less pronounced. Uh, you know, it was 45 to 46 percent is the growth that we saw. And as we had mentioned last time, this year has also been the year where there are 11 to 12 of our contracts of the 17 customers came up for renewal. And due to various reasons, including COVID and uh, various uh, other reasons, they got bunched together in a single year for renewal. We are happy to say that all the contracts have been renewed and the uh, overwhelming majority of those have been rolled over with no price increases. Uh, one or two contracts which were long term, which came up for renewal over five years, there is some amount of reduction that's happened. So all these, uh, together with the mix impact, is contributing to what you see as stable yields on a year-on-year -year basis. However, on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, we have seen the we have seen the yield drop by 0 0.03 bits. That's the commentary on the yield I wanted to leave you with. Uh, we'll just move on to the profitability index and the matrices. Uh, as we had uh, consistently guided, uh, you know, uh, what we are aiming for is the EBITDA margin of 40% plus. And, uh, you know, in the current, and we have seen over the course of the year, the EBITDA margin has kept inching up. Right? Uh, we had a first quarter EBITDA margin of 41.4, the second quarter was 43.3, and the third, third quarter is inched up further to 44.5 percentage. So we ended the quarter with an EBITDA of 108.32 crores. On a year-on-year -year basis, year -on -year basis, this is actually up uh, in terms of, uh, uh, it is down in terms of 4.4 uh, percent, uh, but uh, we have 
have seen an increase increase in margin profile in the course of the year as we progress from one quarter to another. Uh, we would like to remind you that this number also includes the entire expenses we are eating on the new initiatives like the account aggregator, uh, like the TSP business, like the MF Central business that we are launching and the increased expenses that we are incurring from an overall cloud perspective for the various initiatives that we are running. So uh, the, the, uh, the investments in the new business during the quarter has not been slowed down. They continue to be incurred in terms of technology, in terms of platforms, in terms of licenses. As we have consistently guided, we feel that the revenue from these operations would start yielding results from the first quarter of next year. Till then, this is an investment phase we continue to incur, and we have not slowed down the investments uh, for any, any, any reason in the last few quarters. Uh, given all those things, uh, we feel that the margin is a credible <coughs> number of 44.5 percentage uh, for the current quarter. The fact the PBT for the quarter is uh, 97.94 crores, that is 39.1 percent, and the PAT is 73.72 crores, this is 29.4 percentage, so again 2.2 percent up quarter on quarter, uh, but 4 percent down year on year. Uh, we ended the uh, quarter with a cash and cash equivalent of 479 crores uh, of cash in our balance sheet in terms of liquid funds, deposits and balances and the return of net worth was close to 40 percentage. The board was pleased to declare an interim dividend of 10.5 rupees per share in its board meeting yesterday, which has since been notified. So all in all, the, the, the quarter has been characterized by uh, muted growth from an asset-based revenue perspective. Uh, um, not much of a growth from a uh, non-mutual non, non fund perspective, however, uh, due to the additional investments that we are continuing to do in the various initiatives that we are taking, including MF Central, Account Aggregator, TSP, CRA, etc., which we feel will bear fruit in the coming year, we were still able to maintain margins at a healthy 44 plus percentage. So uh, with this, I kind of hand over the, uh, the call back to Michelle. Uh, you can open it up for questions. Thank you very much, sir. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone phone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking your question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. <coughs> We have the first question from the line of Avinash Singh from MT Global. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, what's my question? Uh, the first one, I mean, uh, of course, uh, the large chunk of the revenue is uh, still is tied up. Uh, Sir, I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. Singh. There is a lot of background disturbance which is coming from your line, sir. I would request you to go to your quieter place and talk to you. Yeah. Yes, sir, you're audible. There is a lot of background disturbance, sir. We are not able to understand what you're speaking. Yeah. Uh, so, the question I was asking is that I mean, the line share of our revenue remains tied up with the mutual fund uh, and the other revenue are pushing down. So, now, as I mean, uh, you are getting more specificity on the other revenue streams. So, can we have sort of a, you know, the medium term, actually, uh, next in our year and the year after that, some sort of a, a, a revenue mix or uh, expectation, assuming that I mean, uh, the mutual fund uh, uh, sort of investment is going to be in a state growth. Uh, so, how this net versus non net revenue mix is going to pan out? That's number one. Mm -hmm. Second, if you can help us understand, uh, you know, eventually the revenue model, uh, if there is any option at the center. We have a good question. Thank you. No, sure. So, uh, let me take that. Uh, I think you've heard us say in the past that we want to diversify revenue uh, outside of mutual funds. Uh, and scale it from uh, current levels of 10% to let's say 20% of company revenue. There are uh, three or four businesses that we need to work on and scale and, and they all have, I would say, significant promise. The alternative business is 
is to an extent delivering that promise right now because it is scaling beyond company growth rates and, and to an extent beyond uh, mutual fund growth rates. So that's a good trend uh, to be at. Insurance, our expectation is uh, once this announcement gets implemented and if you see deepening of the trend that we've just shown you, insurance repository could be in that space for the next few years. And then account aggregator could go that way. Again, like we keep saying that it is still perhaps slightly early days. Uh, but we are focused on these three businesses uh, to scale beyond company growth rates and, and produce the diversification. Anything else that we may do on the inorganic side should only add to the overall trend. Is adding many more new products going to be the answer? The answer is no, uh, in terms of how much we can invest and go to market and product build and how much can we consume the teams in these pursuits, I think we have the right balance. Of course, the payments business is also there, and the payments business has scaled, like, you know, 50% of the of the output comes from the mutual fund industry, the rest is diversified. So we think we have a fair mix of products, and we will continue uh, sharing with you as this scale-up happens uh, over this year and the coming years, but uh, it's our absolute focus to grow these alternative businesses uh, or non-mutual fund businesses faster than company revenue growth rate. On MF Central, you know that this is more uh, constructed and designed like a consumer utility. And uh, we've been building it all through 21 when we launched it towards the end of the year. We've uh, nurtured it to the current size and shape all of uh, 22, and we'll continue scaling it. Uh, of course, right now we are not expecting that revenues will even equal costs, they will not. Uh, that may take another four to five quarters, six quarters to happen. But uh, once we get to that point, I think it will be a good point where it becomes a self-sustaining property, uh, maybe at the end of this year, uh, that is an aspiration. Is that going to be a completely uh, profit-focused, revenue-focused entity? The answer is no. It's more built like a public utility to, to just add a significant layer of convenience for the major fund investors, and I think philosophically that's the way we continue to look at it. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Trish Jain from Motilal Oswal. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi everyone. Just a few questions. So firstly, could you, you know, uh, throw some light on, you know, there's a lot of media talk again of, you know, uh, steady kind of uh, uh, looking at, re-looking re at the expenses of the, uh, the TVR for the industry uh, and, you know, kind of talking about consuming the uh, brokerages and uh, other elements, DST elements also into the TVR. So it's actually the use of for the AMC will decline and possibly some part of it will be passed on to you. So is there a revision of the contract that you have done? Is there any clause wherein which you know kind of uh, allows the AMC to renegotiate immediately say the announcement comes in the next three to six months? So Prash, you are right. Uh, there is this live topic and it has the components that you referred to, which means uh, are the components of the TER, uh, what is outside the ceiling, there, there are various components outside. There are some components like transaction charges and uh, for certain kind of cities, if you get consumers from there, uh, there are incentives. So all of that is, you know, it's public news, uh, is under examination. What will happen, uh, time will tell. We are watching it as closely as you are. Uh, again, the only point I would like to underscore is that uh, from a scope delivery perspective, we as RTS have continued to expand the scope every year. We do more and more things. And I think that's evident to the media fund industry that we are doing more and more things for them. Uh, is there any clause as a specific answer in our contracts that they can come and renegotiate, etc.? Of course, there is nothing like that. Uh, we are watching this case. We will see what the outcome is. And if anybody wants to start a dialogue, obviously, uh, we, we know that we have to defend our overall value position and we have to defend our charging, which we have done successfully in the past, as you are aware. Uh, but to answer your question, there is no specific clause like that. Okay, great. Uh, uh, coming to the second question is actually on the margin. Now, you know, uh, uh, 
you're, you're mentioning that you know, in spite of the investments that you are making in the new businesses, the margins are healthy at 44%, and you really can't do jobs for doing that. My question is more on from 1 to FI 24, where you know possibly some of these businesses start trading up. Do you think that uh, you will gain, you will start uh, moving your data margins more towards say 46, 48 percent in that zone, or do you think that you would retain some part of the profitability and uh, and invest in some other businesses and maintain the data margins at uh, at the current level? Uh, how should we start thinking our data margins for next year onwards? So, Prash, I'll take that question. Um, see, just as a quantification, I think you got a delta right, which is that uh, we spend uh, almost one and a half to two percent per, uh, you know, on these on the revenue and in these new investments, which currently do not have a significant top line or a material top line. See, the way we look at it is, uh, uh, and we will have to keep providing for the expenses from a wage inflation perspective from a security perspective. Our software expenses, if you see the operating expenses for the current quarter, the bulk of the increase is because of the additional investments we're making on cloud, on platforms, on security, on various licenses, you know, cutting edge technologies, on databases, tools, etc. So we do not see from our perspective that those investments would stop or decelerate in the next year. Uh, yes, there will be welcome addition to the revenue in terms of the new initiatives. Again, the ramp up would not be dramatic over one quarter. We expect that the ramp up will be gradual over the next year. Having said that, from a margin perspective, I think we are comfortable with the margins and the guidance that we are giving on the close to 43 to 44 percent. In fact, early 40s will be a good margin for us to aspire for. We will continue to make the investments on people, technology, etc. So while the revenue from the top line will continue or will kind of help us, the investments will not slow down. So I don't think we should expect that dramatic increase in the margin profile. Uh, from next year, what it will do is free up more resources for us to keep investing in the other initiatives that we have in mind. So the margins will continue to be range bound is our thinking. Okay, uh, thanks for that. And uh, another question is on the insurance repository business. Now we spoke about uh, the, uh, the you know the settlement of uh, the claims which could not you know earlier settled kind of. Uh, that you so th is that kind of an activity chargeable? And so my question is more broadly as to what are the charges, what are the services that you are currently charging for, and what are the incremental services that can come through? And uh, currently, uh, what is the size of the industry, and what do you expect the industry size to be? Say, you know, uh, when the actually non state implemented. Okay. So I'll again answer the question in two parts. One is uh, our insurance current revenue has got two parts. One is the outsourcing business, uh, which is the, the labor business where we work on various customer systems uh, from a policy servicing perspective, from a persistency perspective. Uh, but the focus and the growth will be on the second part which we are talking about, which is the insurance repository business. Uh, the repository, the current charging model is that uh, we get paid for a policy conversion, which is that a policy that's converted into DMAT or electronic, we get paid by the insurance company. Secondly, we get paid an annual maintenance charge, which is uh, for maintaining that policy in our electronic platform. Thirdly, we get paid for the transaction revenue. The transaction revenue currently is limited in scope because, you know, the scope of the IR as it exists today is limited to maintaining the master data and the policies. Uh, the plan is, is actually very deep. Uh, we plan to do various things and initiatives have already started and getting implemented. Uh, in terms of enriching the platform to be a policy servicing and an and a insured servicing kind of a platform where we are building in various facets including like, you know, the statements, the surrender value computation in terms of other servicing requests, probably even claim processing. So these are rich in transactions and policy servicing which will kind of give us additional transaction revenue going forward. This is the enhancement that's happening as we speak. This would probably get, uh, take a quarter or two for it to get fully into revenue. But this is our scope. In terms of IR specifically on policy conversion, I think all of us are aware of the numbers. Uh, in terms of the policies that are live and not dematted, people are talking about a 45 to 50 crore policies. 
that could potentially get demanded, including those with I, uh, LIC, if the regulation comes through. Now, there's a big gap. So, we don't know what shape and form the regulation will take place. It is going through its own uh, in terms of uh, discussion papers and notes and committees in terms of how the it pan out specifically. Readiness in terms of infrastructure, IRDA is closely on the job and monitoring in all IRs, and we are also one of the committees which kind of goes through this. So, we'll have to wait for how it pans out, but if and when it comes, I know in the course of the next year, we would expect that this will create a big market for policy conversion as well as the platform that we are building for policy servicing. The one new development that's happened is from January 1st, the KYC has become mandatory. Uh, so that we will start getting uh, action on that in a quarter or two from now. In, even the motor insurance policies would require a KYC, which are so longer not mandated. So a lot of happening in that system. We will take probably a quarter for all these things to settle down. But everything is tending towards a positive direction in terms of incremental revenue. So, Prayash, I'll just add to this. Just think of it in two dimensions. One thing that when a mandatory DMAT regime comes, the 2 crore or under 2 crore policies in DMAT can scale to 50 crore and that's a significant multiple in terms of scaling of an industry. Will that go through a bit of uh, price shifts, etc.? Any industry would. But net of price shifts, it will, it will get a revenue scale of, of several X times, could be 10 to 20 X. That's point number one. Point number two, uh, just look at the way you deal with mutual funds versus the way you deal with insurance. Uh, you don't deal in the same way. Mutual funds have allowed you to, I mean, there are aggregator platforms, think of MyCam, so think of MS Central, where you can do everything in one place irrespective of who has sold you the insurance and who has manufactured it. You can do things in one place. That format is right now not available. The e-insurance account will herald that format. It's a significant consumer convenience, which will lead to, I mean, large-scale changes in consumer behaviors because consumers know uh, that behavior in other industries. Why will they not use it here? The question to ask is, will all that become a commercial activity? Will it be paid for? Will it help revenue scale, et cetera? But I think those are the two broad themes I'll encourage you to think about and uh, base your thought process on. Great. Thank you so much for all these answers. Thank you. A reminder to all the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one now. We have the next question from the line of Sanket Kodha from Spark Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, uh, sir, my, my, again, the question is on insurance repository. Uh, so, so uh, in, in the mutual fund industry, uh, uh, means uh, if if it, if an MF chooses one MFRTA, it is it is the hundred percent business given to the MFRTA business. So, are you seeing the similar trends happening uh, in the insurance space? So, so for example, if SJP Life or LIC has chosen to open all the insurance accounts or e policies, whether it will be one insurance repository or it, uh, they will socialize it or, or giving giving it to more insurance repository. So, so just wanted to know how it is going to play out. And and second, you you touched upon the pricing, uh, but but just wanted to understand. Uh, how the uh, pricing, uh, according to you, will will change from the current level? Uh, uh, whether whether you see a steep correction uh, from current what you are charging, or 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 you will see a marginal correction, but but uh, but but it could be a meaningful number from the top line. Uh, so, I think I'll take this question. So, uh, from our understanding and what is prevalent from a market perspective is that uh, there is no. Uh, monopoly or one insurance company going to one EAA, primary uh, choice is with the insured person to kind of where he wants to link his account with. Uh, mm -hmm. which uh, I think the insurance companies would kind of allocate it. What we are seeing uh, is that we don't see many cases where they work only with one insurance repository. It, it is uh, de definitely more than one. So we don't see this RPA kind of a one-on-one -on -one relationship from an EA, from an insurance repository to an insurance company. So it's more kind of more spread out among uh, multiple EAs. Obviously, the primary, uh, you know, it could be the choice of the insured also to pick the EAA uh, provider to whom he wants his account set. From a pricing perspective, we are now it's probably high single digits in terms of what we do for a policy conversion. It is only natural that, you know, for a given volume where we do uh, five to six lakh policies in a quarter, 
two, it is multiple crores. You, it's only the natural that you will expect a sharp depletion in the policy cost. It will not be marginal as in 5% or something like that. We expect it to be sharp, especially given that, you know, uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens to the biggest insurers, how they are going to join this market, what is going to be the architecture for them. But uh, we would be, uh, you know, we would not be surprised if the decline is sharp uh, and uh, it's not just marginal 5% here and there. That's our expectation. But having said that, what this number will be, it's entirely demand and supply dynamics and the uh, who is going to kind of uh, opt for what uh, EAR accounts. So that we have to wait and see. Uh, we don't know the exact indication for that. Probably a quarter or two from now when there is more regulatory uh, certainty on this in terms of the shape of the guidelines. Uh, as you know, the, they are being now upgraded from uh, guidelines to a regulation perspective. That's at least the aim of the IRDA. So all those things get published over the next three months. We will have a greater clarity on what's going to happen. But it's only natural to expect that there will be a rate depletion. Got it. But uh, but, but just, just from the market share point of view, the insurance repository, today today we enjoy around 35-37% market share in the insurance repository. But but as you rightly said, it is probably 2% of the entire policy is uh, dematerialized. So, so uh, we just wanted to understand that uh, this number you expect to, to stay there even, even for the entire uni when, when it becomes for the entire universe or, or, or you think this, there could be a natural depletion in this market share in, in a bigger pile. So, uh, see, as you know, there are four uh, providers as of now who are doing these services, and uh, two uh, actually have similar market shares of 35 plus percentage, which is us plus one more provider. Yeah. Uh, of the four, one is not very active, uh, at least until the last quarter, and yeah. uh, one is kind of a lesser market player. Now, uh, obviously, our endeavor will be to retain and if possible increase our market share on this, and all our efforts are going towards that. Uh, if we are kind of diligent on that and do our work properly, we do not see why our market share should decrease. Uh, you know, obviously, we are working to maintaining and increasing our market share. So, yes, obviously, it's going to be a hard fought market, so we need to kind of work towards that. But I think all our are being made to ensure that uh, we either retain or increase our market share. Got it. And, and, and the last one, uh, on, on the, again on the insurance repository, he, he, uh, uh, actually rightly said that from 1st January, uh, all the non-insurance policies or all the policies that KYC has been made mandatory. So, so uh, I just wanted to understand the trend, whether, whether it has been outsourced to insurance repository or, or insurance companies uh, for, for motor or health are, are preferring to do it in-house. Uh, rather than outsourcing to you people. So, so, so how, how is the trend today and how do you think you will convince, if it is in-house, how you think uh, you will convince the companies to to, to, uh, to, to move out to, to, to insurance repository? So we have some volume proposition. It could be tied up to your EA account opening, etc. So there are some strategies that we have thought about. It's very, very early stages, Sanket. So uh, we, have, we have to see the trend is emerging, especially at the time of maturity, this will actually pick up, right? So it's just being uh, introduced. Uh, we have a proposition from a EKVC perspective, KVC purposes, which we feel is very strong coupled with the EA account opening. Uh, we are going to the market with that. I think a quarter down the line, I'll be able to answer your question with exact details and what the market is doing because I think everybody is on a uh, figuring out basis now. So we will have to wait for a quarter for clarity to emerge. Got it. And, and last one, uh, uh, LIC, I mean, just wanted to understand because it's an elephant in the entire, entire game. So, so LIC is thinking to do it in house, either the e policies or 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 they are open to 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 also to, to the repository industry. Uh, we have no concrete information on that. As I said, we have to wait uh, for more clarity to emerge from a regulatory perspective. What the shape of the guidelines is going to be, regulation is going to be, and how they are going to react. So, I think it's premature to speculate on that, and we have no concrete information on that. Got it. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, uh, Thanks, Tom. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Edox Frederick from Sundaram Major Fund. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. Sir, uh, my question again is a continuation of the earlier uh, participant. So, uh, the insurance repository revenue currently, what is that for us? So, uh, we have insurance repositories, uh, the overall including outsourcing, we don't give a full Twitter, but I will tell you insurance repository, uh, if you do six lakh policies, you know what our approximate realization will be. On an overall basis, the insurance vertical uh, for us is around four, four to four and a half crores a quarter is the revenue. Okay, okay. And uh, this uh, can go up to 10x, uh, assuming that uh, 
we maintain our market share and uh, a majority of the policies come to the So that's the, uh, that's the direction we're looking at, right? So, so uh, let me just clarify, this is the insurance vertical, so out of it there is outsourcing as well as the repository revenue. Repository revenue will be, uh, for a quarter will be around less than a crore of rupees. So that's, okay. that's the component of this. Uh, in okay. terms of growing 10x, again, uh, this is obviously, you know, we are looking at a positive uptick to this revenue. How dramatic that is going to be, we'll have to wait and watch, but we are very positive that this is going to be a, uh, this is going to be a, a reason for us to show increase in revenue definitely in this vertical, given that we are well positioned we are 35 plus percentage market share. We've been in this place for seven years. We have the IT backbone ready. We have the IT infra ready. We have the connects with the uh, customers and insurers ready. So we are very hopeful that this will be a huge uptick in our revenue. But everything is dependent on how the regulations pan out in terms of compulsory demands. Got it. Got it. That is very helpful. The other question again is, sir, on the uh, DER card. So, uh, I mean, how about this last time when the DER card? Uh, uh, did the AMGs uh, approach you immediately after the regulations came in or you did have the existing contract going on for some time? Uh, so how did it happen last time? Uh, the last time when this happened in 2018-19, uh, you may have seen that a number of leading AMCs made a public statement that they believe they will reset the larger components of cost largely connected to sales and distribution. Uh, in that year, if you see historically, any impact that we took was very, very small.